to our esteemed speaker and audience to the 11th edition of the Sri Ram Economic Summit 2022, Asia's largest undergraduate economic summit brought to you by ACCA. This summit is geared towards adding new perspectives to contemporary issues and proposing solutions and alternatives to the status quo. We aim to broaden the horizons of policy, thought, and ensure a healthy exchange of ideas. Today, we have among us the incoming Dean of said business school at Oxford University, Professor Swamitra Datta. I feel immense honor to welcome Professor Datta to our summit. Thank you so much, sir, for gracing us with your presence today. I would now like to invite Dr. Rajiv Jha, Associate Professor in the Department of Economics at the Sriram College of Commerce to introduce and welcome Professor Datta on behalf of the college and the entire student fraternity. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry uh, the event has got some more delayed, but um, I'm sure Professor Datta would let it pass. Um, Professor D Shomitra Datta is the incoming Dean of the State Business School at Oxford. He is current, currently Professor of Management at the Johnson School of Business at Cornell University, Ithaca. He graduated from IIT Delhi and the University of California at Berkeley. He was conferred the Distinguished Aluminous Award by IIT Delhi in 2017. More significantly, Professor Datta would be speaking to us about the role of technology and innovation in business and why they constitute the brick and mortar of modern economies. Professor Datta is an authority on innovation in the knowledge economy. Uh, he's the co-editor of the Global Information Technology Report published by the World Economic Forum and the Global Innovation Index index published by the World Intellectual Property Organization. These two are influential reports on technology and innovation policy. Professor Datta has had a long innings uh, as someone who has written about and taught about and taught us about the role of innovation in the as a building block of modern economies i'm sure you'd like to hear him more than you'd like to hear me so over to you professor Datta. thank you well thank you very much professor Jha and yuvraj and other members of the economic society uh, it's indeed a distinct honor and pleasure to be invited to speak to this uh, audience uh, i'm very well aware that uh, you know Sri Lanka College of Commerce has a very distinguished background history. Uh, this economic summit is one of the most important ones in Asia. And certainly you all collectively as a student group represent the best and brightest of a very important country of a generation. So with all those, uh, let's say, you know, great things going for you, I'm very pleased that, you know, I'll be able to hopefully add some a few additional insights on this topic of technology and innovation. As Professor Jha mentioned, you know, I have spent 30 plus years of my career uh, working in this area. And certainly over these three decades, I have picked up a few insights that I think are useful for young people like you, like most of you, uh, or even for governments and for other organizations that, where you might actually end up working here. I have you know, chosen a simple theme to focus on today. Of course, the whole uh, technology innovation landscape is very, very broad, but I have chosen a very simple theme of, uh, I think the special times we're living in right now. I think we're living in a very unique time, um, especially from a technology innovation point of view. I think the rate of innovation today is so high and it's never been so high in history. And I distinctly remember when I graduated from IIT Delhi, you know, 35 years ago, the situation was in fact uh, very, very different than what it is today for you as you look to graduate from SRCC. Um, and I think this is really because the pace of technology and the penetration of technology in society around us has increased tremendously. Uh, many people call this, you know, we're living in exponential uh, times, and what I wanted to do was uh, focus a little bit on that and focus on especially what I believe is very important, the mindset you need 
to succeed in this exponential world. Uh, there are plenty and plenty of opportunities around. Things are changing very rapidly and very dramatically in some instances. And you all have the privilege of being able to navigate that environment, to be able to create the future, and hopefully do things that are inspirational for others. Because as I said, you know, you are a very special group of people, the best of a generation in India. Now, uh, I have a small set of slides I will use. And just to begin, I will show you a, uh, let me just see one second. I'll just put my slides. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna sh share my slides. So I'm gonna show you a small uh, simulation. Um, this simulation shows a lake in the US, which I'm sure you've heard of called Lake Michigan near Chicago. And the text on the left-hand side basically says that the volume of this lake in fluid ounces, that's another British measure of uh, volume, is about the same as our brain's capacity in calculations per second. Now, you all have heard of Moore's law, which basically articulated in 1965 that computer processing would double every 18 months. Okay? And that has been remarkably true the last 50 years or so. Now, suppose you wanted to fill this Lake Michigan with water at the same rate as Moore's law. So the amount of drops of water entering into the Lake Michigan is doubling every 18 months, okay? Then what you see in the simulation is that for a very long time, and the time is in the top right, you see the simulation begins in 1940 until almost 2010, you don't see any blue. And then suddenly between 2012 and 2025, the blue fills up so rapidly, okay? So what you see is that for almost 60 years, you don't see any water in the lake. And then the amount of water in the lake increases dramatically. And if you in fact take the simulation forward, you know, a few more years, the amount of water expands so much that it fills the whole earth and starts going beyond the earth into the universe soon. And in many ways, I think what we are living through right now is the same phenomena. So technology, especially at least in the measure of computation power had always been doubling every 18 months. So this is not a new phenomena. Started in the 1960s, but it's been going on for the last 60 years. And for the first 50, 55 years, you don't really see the impact that much because the change is incremental. And then what we are starting to see right now is in the last, I would say five years, and now certainly in the next five, 10, 15 years, you will see a dramatic, dramatic potential in the power of computation in terms of what it makes available to us today. You know, even a simple thing like what we're doing, like video conferencing in this kind of a mode, if you recall, even 10 years ago, it was a complete, you know, dream to be able to do this kind of video conferencing that we can do today, either on a web or on a mobile or some other kind of handheld device. I mean, this is something that was not even you know, thought to be easily feasible. Today, we all do it as if it is the most natural thing that is available. Today, we think that the metaverse seems very complicated, a lot of computation, and you know, God knows when it will actually become a reality. But if you look at the space of computation progress, uh, you know, the metaverse might become a reality even faster than what you might think. And this is where I think the challenge comes in out here. So I'm gonna share my screen with some slides so you can see my slides. By the way, before I begin with the other part of my slides, let me just mention that uh, the best way to keep in touch with me is through LinkedIn, okay? So if some of you want to connect with me and uh, keep in track you know, with what I'm doing or what kind of you know, information that uh, I'm sharing, LinkedIn is the best way of doing so. Email, this is my Connell email, but you can find my Oxford and Connell emails online, so it's very easy actually to find it. Now, 
the issue that you see really in this uh, exponential versus linear scenario is that the gap starts increasing dramatically at some point. You know, at some point, if you take a very simple uh, linear series and you go 30 steps, okay? Now you might say that in 30 years, I have increased that series 30 times, and that might seem actually a very high number. But if you take a simple exponential series and go two to the power of one, two to the power of two, two to the power of three, and go on, two to the power of 30, this is equal to one billion is equal to 10 to the power of nine. Okay. Now you see the difference out here in the exponential series and the linear series. And this is exactly what we're living in through today. So if you take, for example, a linear series and exponential series for a very long time, so for almost a very long time, in the case of Moore's law, you saw for almost like 50, 60 years, you don't see much of a difference okay, between the linear series and the exponential series. The gaps and the things are actually quite small. And then at some point, there's an explosion. And right now, what we are seeing really right now is we are living in this age of exploding potential of technology. And the challenge out here is that while technology is progressing exponentially, human beings, we live in a linear world. The institutions, the organizations, the governments we create also are linear institutions. So our natural, our natural tendency is linear while the technology is progressing exponentially. And now we are living at a time when really this exponential curve is going up vertically. So what this means is the gap, this exponential gap between what technology allows and what we as human beings are capable of even absorbing, of, adapt, of adapting to is uh, increasing every year. And this is the reason why you hear many organizations, be it governments or be it in the private sector, they are struggling to keep pace with technology. This struggle is not just a lack of management or a lack of capability. This struggle is a real struggle driven by this exploding gap. So this is the picture that I would like you to keep in mind because this picture tells you a lot about what is happening in the world around us. Now, what is amazing is that Moore's law has been true for 65 years, I've told you roughly, okay, or 55 years. So here you have the transistor count per microprocessor between 1970 and 2019. Okay, so almost 50 years out here. And this is a logarithmic scale. So a linear on a logarithmic scale, as you know, represents a exponential curve on a linear scale. So you see that by and large, by and large, the progress of computation has kept pace with this Moore's law. But what is interesting is that this is 2019. So it's already three years old. You have new chips and new technology coming in in which they're actually changing the gradient of this linear curve on the exponential uh, of the linear curve on the logarithmic scale significantly. So you see the Cerebra chip, for example, raises the rate of progress significantly on this logarithmic scale. And this is happening more and more today now, you know, people had thought that a lot of the chip manufacturing capability would slow down and essentially we would hit some kind of a, you know, plateau in chip power. There are no signs that the plateau is actually happening. In fact, if anything, the plateau is rising. Uh, the speed at which technology is, you know, showing is capable of progressing is rising. And especially if you think about new technologies like quantum computing, which as soon as it becomes commercial will accelerate the rate of progress another five or six times. So 
there are no signs whatsoever that uh, you know this is slowing down. The challenge out here is that you know we as human beings we are not very good at conceptualizing exponential worlds. We suffer from a number of cognitive biases. <clears throat> if you have studied decision sciences, you will hear of many biases and cognitive bias of anchoring bias is one of them. So what does the cognitive anchoring bias basically say? It says that we tend to predict the future too much by putting too much weight on the recent past. So we basically say, okay, this is what we have seen in the last two years and the next two years will be very similar to that. So we tend to, as the anchor, our anchor becomes the recent past. And that's a natural bias in the way human beings act and behave. And that actually is not very, let's say, suitable in the exponential world. That kind of anchoring bias is very good when you have a linear world, when things are changing in incremental mashing slowly. But if things are exploding and things are actually you know, changing in a dramatic manner, these kinds of biases prevent us as human beings in terms of uh, reacting or understanding the world accurately. So another kind of bias is the system one, system two thinking that you probably have heard of from the book by Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel laureate. So what does it basically say? It says that uh, system one thinking is the quick, intuitive thinking that we all rely on for the everyday activity. And system two is much more the deeper thinking, understanding, and then sort of going into depth. And what Daniel Kahneman says basically is that 90% of what we do every day is system one thinking. You know, we don't actually engage in deep thought for every single action. You know, what to wear in the morning, what to eat for breakfast, you know, which road to take to go to the office. Uh, we don't really sit and do deep thinking for these everyday decisions. And partly because if we started thinking deeply for every decision, you know, fundamentally we would spend too much time thinking. We would not be actually acting. So as a natural reaction, human beings have always done more of system one thinking and only occasionally system two thinking. But this over-reliance on system one thinking once again prevents us from understanding exponential worlds because over-reliance system one thinking is caused by these kinds of factors and a law of small numbers, assigning cost to random chance, an illusion of understanding. You think you understand the future is just because you understand the recent past, a confirmation bias, an overconfidence, over-optimism. Um, you know, there are lots of data that shows that uh, people have this overconfidence in their own abilities to predict. Uh, they have a confirmation bias, they like to seek information which reconfirms you know, what they actually already know. But nevertheless, you know, all these biases fundamentally means that as human beings, we are not very good at capturing or being able to handle and visualize exponential worlds. So therein lies the basic problem. So if the world is getting changed exponentially by technology, and keep in mind, technology today is not just only digital technologies. Today, we're having a very unique combination of uh, a merger of the digital, the biological, and the physical. Physical with all this 3D manufacturing, essentially manufacturing of physical objects is becoming a 3D you know, design, software design issue. And increasingly biology with CRISPR and other technologies uh, you're able to program human beings and animals in a certain way, like mRNA technology was also something similar. You see also an example of that in, in case of the COVID vaccines. So what you start seeing is that this unique trifecta of digital, biological, physical coming together is creating an explosion in terms of change that we are seeing around us because everything is being called into question. The way you manufacture a car, the way you treat a patient, the way you, in fact, might do a certain data analysis in an organization, everything around us. And when I say everything, I literally mean everything, okay? Whether it's the environment, whether it's the climate, whether it's, uh, you know, the health issues, everything's getting basically changed by the exponential progress. Now, we know that, uh, as I've said, people have a difficulty in visualizing the future, especially 
exponential future. This is a classical quote from Henry Ford. He said that, well, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Why? Because that's what they could visualize. People are traveling by horse carriages and what they could visualize is the confirmation bias, anchoring bias. They said, okay, I travel by horses. It'd be great if I had a horse which could travel a little bit faster. They could not, and people could not visualize what would a, you know, a world with engines and cars look like. And this kind of a inability of even experts to visualize the technological futures is remarkable. You see so many statements by, made by people. 1995, Robert Metcalf, founder of 3Com, he says, I predict the internet will collapse catastrophically in 1996. Steve Chen, the co-founder of YouTube, he says, I don't think people really want to watch videos, okay? Mike, Steve Ballmer, Microsoft CEO, iPhone will get no market share, will be a flop. There are so many statements like this in which experts too just simply fail to visualize technology futures. So what can you do? So what I'm gonna do is give you four strategies, okay? Four strategies that can hopefully give you some kind of a direction about how to navigate the future, how to look at exponential futures ahead of you. The first strategy is to explore more. Have an open mind and always look for what is happening around you and try to understand the impact of what is happening around you. For example, you, know, you should understand what is happening in the world of technology and unicorns in India. There's so many new unicorns coming up now. You should look at what is happening in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley always has been the source of unicorns. You should look at what is happening in Shenzhen and in China. China is increasingly a really strong power base for digital business models. So you have to be able to explore the world around you and try to understand what is happening in different parts of the world. You know, one of the founders of a major e-commerce company in the US, one of the major ones, big ones, he once told me that he reads, not reads, he said he scans. So the word he used was scan. He scans more than 30 different magazines every week, okay? Now, what he does by scanning is he's basically, his mind is picking up ideas, what he sees, and he's just scanning and seeing, you know, whether, and the magazines can be in all different topics, whether it's in technology, whether it's in architecture, whether it's in other kinds of health issues. So his mind is constantly exploring and trying to see what are some, you know, some trends that pick you, that, that sort of attract your attention. Now, you can, of course, do this in an unstructured manner, like I described this person, you know, scanning magazines every week. But businesses now have realized that they need to explore possible futures more, you know, structured, in a structured manner. And one tool which is being used more and more for this is something called scenario planning. You may have read about this in your classes, but if you have not, you should. Uh, scenario planning is something that has become extremely popular right now, adopted by many, many companies like, for example, Shell, which has adopted a lot of money and effort into creating Shell scenarios. So what Shell scenarios basically does is create scenarios of the future. And as the CEO says out here, it helps Shell, it helps the leadership of Shell to make sense of what is happening in the world and to make better and more resilient and potentially transformational decisions. Now, scenario planning is a whole different topic by itself. I will not go into that in detail, but I'll just give you a high level view so at least you understand that at some level what it is about. So scenario planning is a very good tool only under some conditions. Conditions are as follows. When there is high uncertainty, when there's a need for divergent thinking because there is no clear view of what the future will look like. When the industry in the middle of significant change. Now in a world where technology is increasing exponentially, most of these things are true. The exponential 
growth of technology is creating high uncertainty, whether it's in retail or healthcare or education. There's a need for more divergent thinking. The industries are going through a lot of change. The scenario planning actually is a very useful tool out here. What does scenario planning essentially consist of? Now, I'm just giving you one example of it. I will not go through the process of doing it. But essentially, this is an example from this technology company, Citrix. If you do a search online for Citrix Work 2035, you'll get the whole report. And what Citrix has done is that it has uh, used scenario planning for visualizing what will work look like in 2035. Okay, so what is the future of work? No one knows today, okay, after COVID, after all these changes, you know, what will the workplace look like is not completely certain. So what scenario planning has done for Citrix is allowed Citrix to come up with four different possible future worlds. So how do you create the future world? So the whole process by which you actually identify the various forces of change, you identify the two forces of change that are the most uncertain, the highest uncertainty, the highest impact for you. In this case, as you see, Citrix identified one force of change, which is uncertain is, how will technology affect the worker? Will it augment the worker or will it replace the worker? So that's one big uncertainty in terms of what will happen with technology and the worker. Second, they have identified is the organizational side, will organizational be distributed or will they be centralized? So based on these two key uncertainties in their opinion, they have come up with four different worlds based on the four quadrants out here. And then what they do is they build stories of what this world looks like when the worker distributed and the technology augments the worker. And you can essentially try to visualize what that world will look like. And that's basically what scenario planning is about, is a structured way of creating future scenarios, of trying to imagine what the world might look like and that, of course, has implications for your own actions because what you do in different worlds can, of course, change and will have to change based on the scenarios in that world. Now, the second strategy is also very simple but extremely important. It's around questioning. You know, what is true is that in every organization, we take some assumptions as given. Education, you know, the assumption is that education model has to be teachers and the students, same time, same place. So we build, you know, classrooms, we build buildings and we put students and teach in the same place, same time. There's an assumption we make about how learning takes place. Now, what we have to do is we have to build in questioning inside the organization. Questioning is extremely important. Because today with technology, many of the assumptions that we are holding in business is getting changed. Education, this is a good example. You know, we are same time, but not the same place right now. So there's a different model. You have asynchronous learning, which is not the same time, not the same place. So you have situations where assumptions about your business are getting questioned and you have to go and ask, what is the logical historical basis for the assumptions that you're having? Often you don't know, you don't remember what assumptions you're making because you become part of you know, everyday life. So you have to sort of force yourself to identify the assumptions, ask them why do they exist? Can they be disrupted by forces of change, including technology change? And what's the level of confidence that assumptions will stay true in the, in the future? And today what you're finding is that many, many sectors Education is one example, but I can give you the example of mobility, of car, automobile industry. If you look at the automobile industry, a lot of the core assumptions in the business is getting changed. You know, do customers need to own a car or do they just need to go from place A to place B? As we have seen, all kinds of services like Ola and Blue Dart in India or Uber and other countries, have shown that really maybe what customers need is mobility. In fact, car ownership is falling in many countries around the world. The core technology, you know, do we need engines or is it batteries? Now, this shift from engine to batteries is a major, major shift because 
car companies have spent decades, 100 years, perfecting investing in engines. What is the DNA of the company? Is it manufacturing or is it services? More and more with onboard services, because the cars are connected in real time and the more and more sensors, car companies can deliver services to passengers and the driver in the car. Your car companies are cars are becoming like mobile phones, okay? There's the physical infrastructure, but the real value is in the information services. So the DNA of the company is changing from manufacturing to services. And you have all kinds of new tech firms entering this whole space, and they are bringing a whole new different way of looking at the business. So you see that how a variety of aspects in you know, in this whole automobile sector is getting questioned. And the same is happening in many, many sectors, retail, education, healthcare, and so on. Now, red teaming is a method which comes from the military, adopted very dramatically and successfully by cybersecurity, and now being increasingly saying that, well, look, we can actually do this in regular business. So red teaming is an approach that challenges your plans and the assumptions on which they are based. In cybersecurity, as you know, you know, most companies have two teams. One team actually builds up the cybersecurity defenses and the red team, in fact, breaks the defenses, tries to actually go and find what's wrong. How can the enemy, how can some hackers get and break through the defense? And the same thing today is important in business. It's not just about thinking of the future, but it's really about looking at what could go wrong. How do you stress test your strategy? What are the various weak points in your entire business? And today you can actually apply the specific techniques you know, from cybersecurity and military that come out here. You can actually take those techniques and you can apply them inside a regular business. Because given the kind of exponential change, you cannot take anything for granted. You have to question the unquestionable, think the unthinkable, challenge everything, and have no complacency. Now, these phrases are big phrases, but that's the reality. You know, you look at, for example, in the US, Walmart and Amazon. Today, Amazon has overtaken Walmart in e commerce and in commerce in general. And one reason why Walmart has struggled, not because they don't have money, not because they're not a good company, it's because you know, they've always had that assumption that business is being done in this large super centers, the large stores that they have built. And that assumption has slowed down the adoption of the new business models inside Walmart. It's not because of lack of money, it's because of the mindset issue and because of taking a certain way of doing business as the default assumption and of being unable to think in a different way. So today what you need really is to be able to come up with procedures inside the organization and structures such that everyone inside the organization is really you know, thinking about the unthinkable. And this is exactly the same what people do in cybersecurity. Cybersecurity, the people, one team builds up the defenses, another team is there trying to destroy the defense. Strategy three, I have four strategies for you. The first one was explore more. The second one was question more. And the third one is really a happy one in the sense that the world of possibilities is increasing. There's plenty of opportunities ahead. Why? Because technology is once again increasing. And in this space, the amount of opportunities is exploding. So many things are possible. So, you know, you shouldn't feel bad if India did not create an Amazon. Well, India has some budding Amazon, but really did not create an Amazon. India did not create an Alibaba. So what, doesn't really matter. Now there's all kinds of new opportunities coming up and maybe you have the chance of creating the next generation company that will destroy these traditional players. If you look at, for example, Web 3.0, Web 3.0 is 
changing completely the notion of what the World Wide Web is. You know, we have seen Web 1.0, which is much more read. Web 2.0, what you're living through is read write. And Web 3.0 is read write own. Okay, the people actually will own the system also. And that'll change finance, change retail, change so many different parts of business. So in a sense, what will happen is that the plenty of chances to reinvent the business and to grow the cake. It's not a question of cutting the cake. It's a question of growing the cake. And the opportunities are increasing as technology keep on increasing. So you really have to have this positive mindset and be ambitious, you know, as this author Peter Diamandis, who's the co-founder of Singularity University, wrote in his book on abundance, he says that basically, you know, why go for incremental 10x first, 10 person plus goals? Put stretch goals. You may not reach 10x, but maybe you'll reach 3x. But you should think in big, bold terms because the possibilities are increasing that rapidly. And really what he's saying is that, you know, be positive and have no regrets. And I think this is very, very important because often people feel, well, you know, I missed that and that's too bad. It's like, for example, telecom companies. Telcos gave up. They invented the short message system, SMS, and basically WhatsApp took the entire SMS business away from the telco companies. Now, telco companies gave up and missed the SMS business, but guess what? Now with 5G, they have so many new possibilities ahead. So, you know, don't think about missed opportunities. Don't have too many regrets. Think about the future and have this positive mindset of achieving big in the future because really today technology will allow you to achieve big. And one of the big benefits you have is that, you know, if you spend a lot of your careers in India, India is a big country, you know, with 1.3 population billion, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge country. And you can actually scale up and do good things, big things in India quite easily. My last uh, sort of message really is about being bold. And here, the important message is that, yes, you have to imagine the impossible. You have to you be curious and, you know, and, and, and try and discover what works in the future. But also keep in mind that failures are a part of trading success. As you actually be bold, as you make experiments, you know, try and create the future, you will fail. And that's a natural part of the process. But you have to be bold not to let failures uh, pull you down or to stop you, but to in fact keep on moving. Now, I will share with you some statements from you know, Amazon. As you probably know, Jeff Bezos, when he was CEO, every year from 1997, he wrote a letter to the shareholders for 26 years. And every year he picked up one theme and those letters have become very good management reading. So I'm taking some stuff from his 2018 letter to the shareholders and this is all public material. And he says out here that from very early on, from very early on in Amazon's life, we wanted a culture of builders people who are curious explorers who like to invent and who begin with the beginner's mindset. They don't just see things the way we see things now, but a beginner's, a builder's mindset is to approach big, hard to solve opportunities. And they know that the only solution is to iterate, invent, launch, reinvent, relaunch, start over, rinse, repeat again and again. Okay. Now, as many of you know, Amazon Web Services is one of the cash cows of Amazon. And Amazon Web Services, of course, listens to customers. Of course, they listen very carefully to what people need and they keep on evolving. But at the same time, what is also interesting is Amazon Web Services was created not because of a customer demand. Okay. So no one actually asked for Amazon Web Services. What Amazon did, they had a hunch, followed a curiosity, took the necessary risks and began building, reworking, experimenting, iterating countless times as we proceeded. So this is a very interesting sort of challenge of how do you in fact create the future at the same time listen to your customers. And this balance is a hard one for companies. Okay, Some companies do it very well, like Amazon does it very well. But this ability to be able to listen to customers at the same time think ahead 
is a very important challenge. Now, Amazon also does what we talked about earlier, is imagine the impossible. In the case of physical store, what you know, Amazon discovered was that the worst thing of physical retail was checkout lines. So we imagined a store where basically you could walk in, pick up what you wanted and leave. So these stores are what is called Amazon Go. And of course, Amazon Go was not easy to create. It was technically very hard because the technology wasn't ready. They had to create and invent new vision algorithms, including stitching together imaginary from hundreds of cooperating cameras. And they had to have technology in the intelligent aisles to be able to do this possible well. So Amazon, as some of you might know, is one of the world's biggest investor in R&D. They invest tremendously, sometimes even more than Apple and more than Google in R&D. And this is very interesting because they are a retailer. They're not a classical tech company. The retailer would do this. And this is my favorite one from his 2018 newsletter is about failure. He says, as a company grows, everything needs to scale, including the size of your failed experiments. So he's not just saying fail or have failures. He's saying you need to have some big failures too. For example, for Amazon, Fire Phone was a big failure. Now, why is this important? Because what he's saying is that you need to be taking risks and taking risks at a size and scale that will impact the organization. Because if the risks you're taking are fundamentally you know, not large enough, then even if you succeed, it will not change the company's direction in a significant manner. So to be able to change the company's significant manner, you have to be able to take risks that are significant. Doing this is not easy because you know, big failures are never actually welcomed in most companies. But the important thing he says is not just only about having failures, but also about the need to scale. My last statement and my last comment is this one from a very famous you know, player, Michael Jordan. He says, I have missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I have lost almost 300 games. And 26 times I have been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. He says, I have failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. If you just think about these words more carefully, they're very, very powerful words. Very powerful words. Mm -hmm. Because especially for you all, now as you start, you know, you all are young, you're starting out in your career right now, and you're trying to say, you know, how do I in fact shape my career? What do I do? And I would say, you know, you have all the ingredients, you have done well, and that's the reason why you are here right now, you know, at Freedom College of Commerce. And you have all the foundations to make great progress, achieve great things. The challenge for you is to be able to take risks. And if I had to give you one advice in terms of, you know, 30 years later, 35 years later, you know, from where I was in your position, if there's one thing I wish I had done a little bit more about was take more risks. Take more risks in terms of what you do. Maybe go for a startup, you know, doesn't matter if you don't succeed. Go and work for a startup, you learn a lot. Or do some other interesting things in a large company. Large companies also are extremely powerful, you know, foundations for doing successful things. But essentially try and learn something new always. So go into a different sector and learning something new will never, never hurt you in any way. Okay. The other day I had a great speaker from Coinbase in my class at Cornell. And he gave the same advice. He said that, look, you know, Web 3.0 is all over us right now. Web 3.0 today is where Web 2.0 was in 1995, okay? Early days, very early days. We don't actually understand it very well. So, you know, try and experiment, try and see what can you do with Web 3.0 as an example. But of course, it doesn't have to be Web 3.0 necessarily. It can be healthcare, it can be education, it can be so many different topics. Everything around us is actually changing right now. And what I want to tell you is that you are incredibly lucky to be here at this point 
not just being young, but just being at that critical point where technology is picking up, you know? India's economy is opening up. The world is, of course, a more interesting place, despite all the problems we see, you know, in Ukraine and China, Russia, and so on. I think it's a very, very unique time. And the fact that you are starting your careers is a blessing, you know, it's a tremendous blessing. And I think you should be, you know, the focus on abundance, you know, have the mindset of abundance and be positive, be optimistic, and the great things that are possible ahead of you and the great things that I'm sure you'll achieve, you know, individually and collectively. So thank you very much for this chance to share this presentation or share a few ideas with you. And I pass it back to the organizers. I'm happy to take a few questions if there are any few questions uh, that you have. Yeah. Thank you, sir. First of all, I must say that this was a supremely knowledgeable discussion. And firstly, I have a question of my own as well. So you spoke about anchoring bias and how it prevents us from visualizing exponential futures. Keeping that in mind, many people have the reservations about the worldwide shift to electric vehicles. Do you think these reservations that people have are a symptom of anchoring bias or are they justified? No, I think, you know, uh, the anchoring biases come in individually and collective formats. So look at, for example, Tesla. Tesla, 10 years ago, Tesla was actually going and begging the car companies in Detroit to adopt the technologies to work with them. Tesla was a small little startup and Tesla was begging these big players to actually adopt the technology and work with them. And all the big players said, no, no, you know, this electric stuff will not work. You know, what our customers need is really this hard engine driven cars that we have succeeded with. So it was the assumption that people are working with that basically prevented them from looking at a possible near future. So what happens is, you know, individually and collectively, we sometimes fail to realize the full pace of change simply because the pace of change right now is picking up dramatically. So yes, some of the same biases, you know, come in effect or influence our lack of ability to be able to think creatively about the future. And this is true in many, many organizations, you know, right now. Thank you, so that was very well answered. And there were a couple of questions in the chat box as well. I will proceed to ask those now. So the paradox of technological growth governs how the economy slows down for a while in the initial phases of technological advancement. And for a country like India, where labor supply is way beyond absorption capacities, could we say that shifting jobs of a man is the only way for innovation? It's a very important point this question is uh, raising is this whole linkage between technology progress and jobs, you know, because there's a whole, uh, okay, so historically over the last 100 years, there have been various waves of digital technologies that have come and gone, and that have, you know, sometimes displaced certain generations of workers uh, across uh, technology shifts. Now, technology shifts will occur in the future too, the question which is interesting is that uh, are these technology shifts occurring at a faster pace? One is, you know, is the capacity of society to handle the changes, you know, decreasing because the coming so fast? And second is because of AI, is it actually having a wider impact across society? It's not just one group, you know, let's say we move from transportation by, from trains to planes, you know, the number of people working in trains decreases, the number of people working in planes increases. So it's not just one technology, but it's broad based across a number of technologies. Now, the honest answer out here is no one knows. Okay, no one knows exactly. Uh, there are two schools of thought. So one school of thought says that uh, no, you know, we will adjust, and you no, know, we have adjusted historically, and so the society will adjust. Yes, yes, there'll be some displacement, but there'll be some adjustment. Uh, and uh, the other school of thought says, no, there will be large scale displacement, you know, so there'll be large scale displacement and essentially you will have a challenge society. Uh, like, for example, you know, in self-driven cars and trucks, you know, what do you do with a 40 year old truck driver? You know, can you take a 40 year old truck driver and convert him into a, you know, into a digital data scientist? No, that's not, that's not easily done. Now, in the case of India, I think the same arguments hold, but I think in the case of India, the digital technologies now are allowing people to actually get jobs on a global basis, uh, which actually is a positive thing. So my own sense is today, the many gig workers you know, who otherwise, you know, India has not succeeded as much in creating new jobs as the economy should have created. So when you have these kinds of new gig workers and you know, uh, other kinds of 
job opportunities for people, whether it's locally or globally, that's actually a positive thing. So I do think it's a very careful uh, balance that has to be observed very carefully. I do think the government has to focus on much more on skilling and making sure skills are updated because the number of jobs in the new area is increasing. So people like you all also, when you go about you know, in your school, you should be having many, many more courses on data sciences and AI in your economics uh, program. I don't know how much you have of that, but that's something that skill is required in the future. <clears throat> so I think all of us institutions, governments, we have to focus on skills upgrading and then basically, you know, very carefully look at this whole balance of jobs and people, because that is a very important point, because, you know, you can't afford to have large scale unemployment in a country that will lead to all kinds of negative consequences. So it's a very important point and we all have to work on it together. And there is no clear, definite answer in terms of what will happen in the future. Thank you for answering, sir. If your time permits, could we take up one last question? Sure. Okay, so given the varied demographics of India as compared to most Western nations, is adjusting development here based on parameters given by international institutions set in the West, the best way to determine growth, especially in terms of technological advancements? See, I, I don't think so. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we should look at growth in India as being set by the West. I think that's, you know, that's not a very, I think a correct or a healthy mindset to have. Uh, I think today growth is being driven by two fundamental forces is the power of technology and the ability of people. And both of these things are inherent in the country. You know? So if you look at, for example, people, we have a lot of people in India, certainly, but you know, are we actually leveraging the full potential? You, know, you are lucky to study in you know, SRCC, there's so many young people like you who haven't got education in India. So we should be talking about how can we bring more people into education and get them education in India as a way of unleashing the potential of people inside the country. Look at technology. Technology is progressing dramatically. And we should be asking about, uh, you know, are we doing the right amount of research and investment in technology? You know, Indian companies invest a very, very small amount in R&D. Indian companies, Indian economic sort of uh, organization don't really do much R&D. I think the Indian R&D investments is roughly about 0 0.6, 0.8% of the, of the GDP. You know, leaders, leading countries, you know, they spend about, the leaders like Israel and South Korea spend about 4 to 5% of GDP. And even countries like the US spend about 3% of GDP and China spends about 23 2.2% of GDP. So what I'm saying is there's a huge gap that Indian businesses, Indian organizations have to do in terms of investing in R&D. And I would suggest that you know, we focus more on building our own human capability, investing more in technology R&D, like for example, AI. You know, AI is a huge force of the future and we are not doing much in AI. We should be doing so much more in AI right now inside India. And that's what we should focus on and be less concerned about you know, things aren't being imposed on us. There's nothing, there's, there's no one imposing really anything significant on us, okay? It's what we create for ourselves that's the important thing for the future. Thank you so much, sir. We are truly honored and grateful to have had you as a speaker at the Sri Ram Economic Summit this year. Um, it was an incredibly insightful session and I'm certain that we have all learned a lot. So once again, I would like to thank you for taking out the time from a busy schedule to be with us here today. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And I wish all of you all the very best in your careers. And I'm sure you will do great things for yourself and for the country.